Welcome to Prairie Fire, I'm Sarah Edwards. When you drive through the small farm towns of Illinois, you might notice that it's just a handful of businesses that make up the social and economic fabric of those towns. And sometimes it's just franchises or big chain stores. But in Tuscola, Illinois, Flesser's Candy Kitchen rules. It's a family owned success story that nearly disappeared. This is a pretty funny story and I think it's gonna leave you hungry for some chocolate. My sister Ann Flesser Beck and I reopened our family's confectionery in 2004. We came back to Tuscola to do this because we are crazy women. We missed our family's heritage and I guess wanted to recreate the Greek American tradition that was started by our grandfather in 1901 here on the corner of Main and Sale in Tuscola. My grandfather and um, two other fellows, uh, both of them not too long off the boat, were here in Tuscola. It was uh, Mr. Vakey, Mr. Briner, and my grandfather. They were trying to figure out how to, you know, make candy and have a soda fountain and whatnot. And then my grandfather apparently decided he wanted to own this himself. My grandfather ran it for over 70 years. If you were young again, and you had it to do all over once more, would you begin a shop like this one? Sure. Why did you come back? Because he wanted me to. My father asked me to. My father was just this crazy Greek guy who yelled a lot. You don't have to buy candy. You don't have to eat it. And my mother was martyred. Plesser's wife, Betty, helps with the candy kitchen's business. She was suffering from martyrdom, yeah, here working in the store. Do you ever get tired of looking at candy? <laughs> yes, frankly, I do. We have these big candy knives. Apparently, my grandfather chased my father out of the store, waving the knife, right? He was going to kill him. My father did the same thing to my brother. We're the only country that really gobbles up candy in large quantities. I think that uh, like 18 pounds a year per person. My parents went out of business in the late 70s. He had had enough. How many years was this closed before the girls came back and opened it? For a long time. A long time, wasn't it? I was teaching um, primarily at Eastern Illinois University in the English department. My sister went to Iowa, then Connecticut, uh, then she came back to Illinois. I was driving through town and there was a for sale sign in the window. And I thought, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> she invited me over to my mother's um, place and my mother was still living and, and she introduced the idea of us going back into the family business. She introduced that idea while we were drinking wine. Danger, danger, danger. Sure, let's do it. I could have killed him. The building had been empty for decades, and we spent so much time scraping and scrubbing. So I had heard a rumor, because it's a small town, right? I had heard a rumor that our antiques were still in storage. So I called the guy. I called the guy. I called the guy who had them, and um, he said he'd be happy to sell them back to us. The other thing we had to figure out how to do was how to make candy. 
because my brother, he was the one who helped make candy with my father. My brother was taught to make candy because he was a boy. It's kind of dangerous and it's and the kettles are heavy, heavy and all that. My brother still had the recipes that my grandfather had given to my father who gave them to him. Before we opened, my sister and I sat at her kitchen island and ate chocolate for like two days. It was really kind of disgusting. And we decided that we love guitar chocolate. It's so good. We use real cream and half and half and sugar. We make our own fondant for our buttercreams. If you come here, you should absolutely get caramels. Um, peanut butter pudding, better than Reese's peanut butter cups. We have these little peanut butter squares. We also make peanut butter eggs at, at Easter time. Our toffee is very good, though if you are old and have bad teeth, it might be a little hard to, but it's really good. We also have excellent peanut brittle. We have a real soda fountain. We have, you know, carbonated water. We also serve breakfast and lunch. We know how to cook, ish. We're like crazy breakfast Nazis, I'm afraid. And we and at 10 o'clock, we cut off breakfast. And if people, you know, dawdle in at 10, 10, we say, no, you may not eat breakfast. And we serve lunch from 11 to three. And then we cut it off at three. And we say, no, you may not have lunch at 3.05. It's really kind of awful of it. We're awful, we're awful. Betty says both she and her husband, Paul, when he was alive, wanted their kids to have a better life than this. It is hard to run a place like this. It's physically exhausting and mentally exhausting. Look at them, they're haggard. <laughs> She's right. My sister and I, while we were in business together, fought almost every day. Now, I thought she was a nitpick and she thought I was a space queen. Our That's customers true. were used to us yelling at each other across the room and we made up all the time. Our separate skills made the store strong. Our separate personalities, I would argue, made the store strong. I also uh, found a, a new husband, so that helped. He retired from his real job that paid and um, learned how to make candy with me. If he had not come along 11 years ago, I think I might have given up. And now that my husband has joined the business officially, right, um, he can bring his personality into it a little bit too. My wife and I are only going to be able to work for so many more years, right? right. We're going to have to either train people or let them train people or uh, give it up. My husband um, would like me to say, of course I'm going to retire. You bet, and we're gonna live in a lovely log cabin on the side of a mountain somewhere soon. And I better not say what I'm really thinking. I don't, I don't know, I like working. Is that weird? That is weird, you yeah. know. We can't make candy for the whole world, impossible. We're, we're a little, little one horse operation, but we can serve a lot of people, and we do. By the way, we are haunted. That's an aside. There are other people here. <laughs> she is hysterical. You know, my kids are major chocolate fans, so I hope they didn't see that. Speaking of which, I was up in Chicago recently with my kids and we were at a museum and my son asked me, Mom, where do they get all of the green leaves and all the fake roaring dinosaurs that we see around us? And it turns out, a company in Rantoul, Illinois, is one of the largest fabricators of museum exhibits in the United States. It's called Taylor Studios. Everything starts with a story. The experience of any exhibit actually starts when you first get out of the car, off the bus, walk up to the building. As soon as you enter the space, the first thing you do as a visitor is you kind of take it all in. What do you see? What's out there?
what are they reading? What are they touching? What are they feeling? What are they hearing? We can even do smells. What are they smelling? Taylor Studios started in 1991. In the 30 years that I ran the company, we did over 700 projects in 45 states and four countries. I lived across the street from Joe Taylor, and he was an artist, and he got a job with Gary Breeze, who was a taxidermist at the time. And Gary got a job to make some trees for a nature center and they had to just sort of figure it out. And then Joe and I realized this was an industry. People built exhibits for a living. You can't beat that, like that is so cool. So it was just Joe and I in the beginning um, doing the artifact and fossil reproductions, like selling our wares out of the back of the pickup truck, going to events and trade shows. So that was the sort of humble start, but knowing that we wanted to fabricate exhibits for museums, but that kind of got our name out there and we sold those all over the world. We were in a very old farmhouse in Muhammad. There was a chicken coop on the property that we renovated. And then um, to the, the west, there was an old, really beautiful barn, a two-story wood barn with a big, you know, hayloft. So in 2007, I bought the old Walmart building, which is where we're sitting in today, so that we could do all production under one roof. Exhibits are stories in 3D. In a museum, you know, only about 2% of their collection is on display. So it's really difficult for our clients to decide what story to tell because there are so many. And so you have to pick and choose what you think will engage your audience or what you think the important story of the time is. A good exhibit is an exhibit that can transform you to another time and place. A project usually starts um, with a museum having, or a nature center, having an idea. I want a mammoth. All right, that's, that's a good starting point. There's still in some interpretation and story to tell there. How is that mammoth interacting with things around it? How do you want to see that mammoth? Is it just looking straight? Is it head up and rear to the left? Is it up on one, you know, up on three legs and one leg's up in the air? Or is it just standing there? Is it grazing in the grass? All those tell a story. The overall process for Taylor Studio's amount of work um, for one gallery is usually about 18 months, 12 months of design and about six months of fabrication and install. The process starts with resource analysis, which is gathering all the resources that the client has. Then we go to schematic design. Schematic design is more of a floor plan layout of the space and kind of divvying up budget. Then after that, then we get into what we call conceptual design. Conceptual design is when we, what I say is when we start making the pretty pictures. We start doing some sketches, we put some color to them, we have renderings, and it really starts coming together, give you that visual of the space. Then we go into detail design. Detail design is when you start putting dimensions to those really pretty pictures. You start calling out what material, materials will be used. And then we start fabricating. We fabricate everything at Taylor Studios and repurpose Walmart. And uh, we put it together there for the first time. Then we disassemble, we put it into trucks and we ship it all over the country. Shipping items is an adventure. We always have to think about how does a piece get made in a Walmart in Illinois and get to and inside an exhibit. So a lot of our pieces do come apart and then they are then reassembled on site and seamed on site. In our life cast figure uh, 
fabrication method. We used to have to stick straws up someone's nose, have them hold very still, and cover them in alginate. Very claustrophobic, very scary. We've now can 3D scan someone's face and their head, and we print that on a resin printer to give us quite a bit of detail on that, on that face. Then we can paint that head and paint it to look um, extremely real, let's say. Now, we still use the alginate molding and casting method um, on hands um, so that we can get the very fine detail, the pores in your fingers, the little fine cracks in your knuckles. Usually the bodies are carved out of foam. And then after that, the foam is hard coated. And then we actually have to make limbs removable in many cases to help put on the clothing. The fabrication of exhibits is definitely moving to a more digital age. We have a CNC router to cut wood and plastic. We have a CNC plasma that will cut metal. Uh, we have PLA and SLA printers that we can actually 3D print objects. Uh, we have a robot arm um, that can cut foam, but we see them more as a tool. You still have to have that artist's eye, and I think the human element of it and the artistic element will always be there, and that's what really will give you a dynamic exhibit. A lot of our client base is, is natural history or history or a lot of nature centers, but art museums are then a completely different ballgame, right? And, but I think the problem is with art museums is they're not drawing new audiences. You know, so it's almost like hoity-toity and you feel like I'm not rich enough to be in here or something. So are you gonna draw people from all the neighborhoods into this museum when they feel uncomfortable because you've designed this space to feel like you don't belong here? We can't do that in this industry. We are in competition for people's leisure time, so it has to be an exhibit that will draw people in and they want to be there because they could just put a virtual reality set on and stay at home. But I think, you know, it, once again, it's about a sense of place or the authenticity of a real object. I think that is so much more impactful, emotional, authentic um, than any virtual reality experience could be. So I um, sold Taylor Studios in December of 2021. I think a little bit, I, um, after 30 some years, I, I, I hate to admit this, but I was a bit wore out. You know, so all my, my sleepless nights were about the people. You know, I mean, there's always cash flow crunches and are we gonna make sales and is this client happy? Um, but it's about your people. And so I knew that was important to take care of the staff and to take care of the legacy we've built here as Taylor Studios. You know, as the older you get, the more risk averse you become. And I knew we needed to go in a different direction and build the digital fabrication studio, but you have to invest. Reggie is doing that, and so that is really exciting for Taylor Studios right now. So it's time for me to just um, manage sheep and horses. <laughs>
Strangers in the night. And that's why I'm on this side of the glass. My name is Mark Rubel. I lived in Champaign, Illinois from about 1960 to 2013. And uh, I'm a recording engineer producer, a musician of sorts, uh, audio educator mainly. Better musicianship with louder amplifiers. It's a cigarette case. It's a guitar amp. Here's a fun thing. This is called a thingamagoop. This is a moving fader system. The uh, faders are showing the levels that we have in the computer system. Well, I always loved music, and there was always a lot of music around the house. When I was about six or seven, my dad made a box for us called The Monster, which was a, a uh, wooden box that had just levers and switches and a car dashboard and all sorts of things that made noise, horns and things. And I think that was an early obsession with a uh, mixing console. You know, it sort of looks the same. It's a big box with a bunch of knobs and switches on it. Come on, come on, down, do -do -do down, down. Break it up as hard to do. In 1980, some friends of mine and I started a rock band, sort of uh, restarted a rock band called Captain Rat and the Blind Rivets as a uh, scam to get pool passes to the intramural pool at the U of I, which uh, the show culminated in our guitar player Tim Veer uh, skateboarding off the high dive with his guitar into the deep end of the pool, which we hadn't warned anybody about beforehand. It ended up with their being banned from the pool, but uh, People thought it was funny, and they uh, asked us to play more shows, and uh, that was 39 years ago. And, you know, 39 years of being in the same band is an interesting experience. You don't really expect to be in the band long enough to, for people to become grandparents, you know. But uh, if you're going to get older, being in a rock band is a good way to do it. You know you make me want to shout! As, a, as an undergrad at the U of I, I had a chance to make a movie soundtrack in a recording studio called Silver Dollar. When I walked into the studio, it was the epiphany moment where the angels sang and a blade of light came down from the heavens, and I just knew it was what I wanted to do. You know, it's just it's a magical place, a recording studio. It's full of, you know, gently blinking lights, and it's always five o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, it's a place where you walk into an empty room and you come out with some music that can live forever. After I graduated, I worked as a booking agent and a musician, and I ran across a guy named Peter Fox Penner. And Peter had had a recording studio. He built it on his girlfriend's farm in southern Illinois. And then after she dumped him, all the studio had to come out of the house and was in storage when I met him. So we decided we are going to make a studio in the house that they were renting for $100 a month. So we did. We just took the equipment that Peter had had in storage and wired it together and called it a studio and all the other partners had electrical engineering degrees and real jobs. I had a crazy liberal arts degree, and uh, so I got elected to run the gear and do the sessions, and pretty much been doing that since 1980. So the original studio was 1980, was called Faithful Sound, and we were there for about three years. All sorts of interesting projects, and it was an exciting time right around then, the early 80s. It was a great time in Champagne music. I have to say, just about every time is a great time in Champagne music. It's a wonderful oasis of creativity, and being in Nashville, where there's sort of the ultimate talent in the world, um, there are players in Champagne who are every bit as good as people in Nashville. It's just in Nashville, there are hundreds of them, but in, in Champagne, I mean, really the, the quality of the musicianship, the quality of artistry is just unbelievable. So we're just so lucky to get to be there. So I started Pogo in 1985, started teaching in 1987, and uh, was going strong until 2013 when I moved it down here to Nashville. I was happily ensconced in my studio. The building was paid for in downtown Champaign, and all the gear was paid for. And I had a wonderful job at Eastern Illinois University in a community that I dearly love. But I had the absolute opportunity of a lifetime. I'd been teaching audio for decades at this point and had the opportunity to start essentially the recording school that I'd been building in my head all the time, just thinking, you know, I, what would be the ideal recording school that we could come up with and the chance to build it at Blackbird Studio, which is possibly the greatest studio in the world. Uh, and the chance to connect there and to be in Nashville, which is 
increasingly the center of the musical world and definitely the center of the recording world. To be part of that community, I had to do it. So just when that opportunity came up, uh, with the uh, consent of my long-suffering wife, Nancy, we just uh, you know, sold the building and packed everything up and moved down into this building to start a school. I had no contract, no guarantee, and we made it happen. It was the second best thing I've ever done next to Mary and Nancy. Well, recording is fascinating because it just involves so many different aspects and there are so many different things that one needs to know. Uh, I think at the heart of it is a love of music uh, and a love of being around musicians, which is not hard because they're great people to be around. Just to be involved in the creative process is fantastic. There's so many other aspects too, though. You know, there's the psychology of it. Uh, there's the music theory part of it, just being able to hear things and have ideas. Uh, there's the engineering part, which it sort of looks like that's the most important part, but really all the uh, technology and all the knob twiddling and so forth is just in, is really in service to the music and the creative process. I think it's useful in a studio to have somebody who's calm and you know relatively in control or, and can uh, you know sort of steer from behind and, and uh, you know nudge people along the way but stay out of the process when necessary. A big part of the process really is knowing what not to say and uh, when not to interfere and then when to say the things that might be helpful. So I think it's helpful to have the sort of uh, bass player's personality, which is you're supportive, you're laying the groundwork, uh, but you're not necessarily, you know, up front. Uh, and uh, although I'm a little different on stage, this is actually, this is the costume, the stage is actually the real me, but that's a different story. Check out the stories we've produced about Mark over the years on our website at will.illinois.edu slash prairiefire. We leave you with Mark's unreleased hip-hop version of the University of Illinois alma mater. Hail to the orange, hail to the Be.